Howdy, howdy, this is Mr. Potter. In our previous unit, we talked about the internet, how to transport items. We talked about all the different internet protocols that exist. What we're going to do in this unit is we're gonna talk more about uh, security and encryption, those two things. And we're gonna start with the need for encryption. Why is encryption so important? So we're gonna jump over here to talk about exactly what is encryption. So let's say that there's some message that I want to send like hello world but I don't necessarily want anyone who looks at this message to understand exactly what it is that I'm sending so what I'm looking for is I'm looking for something that's easy to encrypt in other words it's going to be very easy for me to transform this into something else and that something else is going to be hard for strangers to decrypt and then I should be able to have whoever I'm trying to send this message should be able to get hello world out of this message so in other words it should be possible for a target to decrypt so in other words I, I want it to be hard for almost everyone to do it except for the person who knows my rule now the thing is there's got to be some rule to encrypt and there's got to be a technique to decrypt so our job is to find some way to encrypt and decrypt in such a way that it's easy for us to do it it's going to be possible for whoever I want to send the message to to decrypt it but it's got to be hard for whoever we're talking whoever's going to be in the way to decrypt this and figure out what our hidden message is because sometimes in the case of war I'm not going to want a total stranger to have access to this I definitely don't want the enemy to have access to, to this message uh, it may give away my war plans and of course the need for a the need for an encryption technique goes all the way back to the Roman army uh, Julius Caesar had this technique where he would take the letters of an alphabet like A, B, C, D, E, and so forth. And what he would do is he would rotate them three letters over. So A would become D, B would become E, C would become F, G, H, and so forth. And so if I wanted to translate the, translate the message, hello world, what would happen is I would have to take each of these letters and kind of advance them three letters. So if I did this, H becomes I, J, K. E becomes F G H, L becomes M N O, O becomes P Q R, W becomes X Y Z, O becomes R, as we talked about, R becomes S T U, L is going to become M N O, and D is going to become E F G. So now I've got Kahur's Rog, which doesn't make any sense in English. But if the person I'm sending this to knows that I advanced every letter up three and knows all that they have to do is just kind of go back three, well, let's take the letter K. If I go backwards in the alphabet, I go to J, I, and H. The letter H is going to go to G, F, and E. The letter O is going to go to N, M, and L. And so by following this process, R goes to O, Z goes to W, R goes to O, just like we said, U is going to go to T, S, R, O is going to go to L, just like we did before, and G, according to this table, goes to D, and so they're able to get our message of hello world by taking each letter back three. So we have this technique of being able to send a message to whoever we want to, by adding three letters and then subtracting three letters. Of course, the issue here is if someone knows the secret, then they should be able to figure it out. And because there's so much written in the English language, there actually is a pretty fair standard of letter distributions. Uh, those of you who have ever watched the game Wheel of Fortune, you may remember at the beginning they give you the letters R, S, T, L, N and one vowel E. The thing is my vowels end up being the most used letters in a language. A, E, I, O, and even U is quite well used. 
And if I take a look at the consonants that I've got, let me just draw a line here at this 0.06 level. Everything that's above it, that's my E. There's an H, which shows up quite a bit. Uh, here's N. Here's uh, P, Q, R is above that. S and T are all above that. And then we have the letter L, which although it's below, makes a lot of compound letters. And so it's often very helpful in figuring out these letters. Um, so I see this a lot. And if you've ever played Scrabble, you'll notice that certain letters like J or X or Z have a very high point value because they're some of the fewest used letters in the English language. Usually J or X are counted at eight points each, eight points each and Q or Z are counted at 10 points each, just because they're not used as much. Whereas my vowels, A, E, I, O, and U, uh, those tend to be one point each, just because of how often they show up in the English language. Every word needs a vowel. So if I wanted to figure out how Caesar did it, all I would need to do is take a look at his word and count out how many times he used each letter, because he's not just going to be sending a simple message like, hello world. He's probably going to be sending a paragraph, and it would be relatively easy for me to count up all the letters A through Z and figure out, okay, which one's the most? The one that's the most is probably going to be E. Which ones are the fewest? The ones that are fewest are probably going to fall under these categories, and I probably don't need to look at them that much. So the idea of using a letter distribution to figure out which letters are used the most often is the key to breaking this type of cipher. Well, then what if we decide instead to do something a little bit different? Let's say that I want the letter A to be represented by the letter P, but the letter B may be some other letter. Maybe I'm going to use the letter E to represent the letter B. And for the letter C, I'm going to let N, and for the letter D, I'm going to let I, and for the letter E, I'm going to be uh, use the, I mean, let me make this a C so it actually spells out pencil. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let these kind of be my letters. And I can continue on with different substitutions. Because what I'm doing is everywhere I see one letter, I'm going to be replacing it with some other letter in no discernible pattern. The thing is this letter distribution that we talked about will still help with that because the letter that shows up the most is probably going to be our letter E. So looking at this Cryptoquip, and this actually shows up quite a bit in the newspapers, like an entertainment, a game that you can play in the newspaper, because uh, newspapers are full of word games, I'm noticing that the letter S shows up an awful lot. I mean a lot. I mean here it's showing up some more down here, and there's another S here. So maybe I think the letter S is a vowel. And of course, I noticed that the letter W shows up quite a bit as well. I mean, I wouldn't expect to see the letter W show up so much. So maybe the letter W is a vowel. And of course, they tell us that A equals P. So I know wherever I see a P, that's got to be a vowel. So I certainly could come up with the five most used letters up here and see how they correlate to our letter distribution. Now, keep in mind that this is trial and error. And of course, because this message is kind of short, then it's not necessarily going to um, follow that distribution exactly, but it's going to be close enough for our purposes. And of course, it depends on what type of message is being sent. So down here, notice that the way that they've done this message tends to use the letter O quite a bit. And so I might think that letter O may end up being overrepresented. Uh, I am talking about a writer, and I'm using the word when and would, so maybe the letter W is going to be overrepresented as well. And so I do have to watch out for that. Notice the letter E doesn't show up nearly as much as some of the other vowels, so E would be underrepresented. But the frequency should still hold up pretty well. So where do we go from here? Well, maybe, maybe instead I can decide that I want to... Uh, choose a different word. Like here I've got computer. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say H-E-L-L-O-W-O-R-L-D. The letter H, I'm going to look at the C in this table and see where H goes. H is right here, so I'm going to get a J out of it. 
And then for E, I'm not going to advance at the same number of letters. I'm going to advance at a different number of letters. At O, I'm going to look where E is, and that's a T. In other words, I'm using a different letter of some keyword to encode the letters in here. And if I run out of letters in my keyword, well, I'll just start repeating it. Now, this is the Vignier cipher. There's actually supposed to be an accent over here. <clears throat> but the idea behind the Vignier cipher uh, is that it's supposed to be a lot more difficult to crack because now distribution's not going to work. I should end up with a distribution that's very even. Everything should be at around 4% because I've got 26 letters to choose from. And this is one of the nice things about the Visionaire cipher. It's actually Visionaire. So we're going to talk more about this in our next video, these more complicated ciphers. But what I want to talk about right now is I want to go back to code.org. We've been doing the code.org, and we're on stage 13 for code.org. So we're going to take care of all of these options today. The first thing I want to do is I want to go through step one, and this is basically telling us the information. Here's some of the vocabulary we have. An algorithm is a sequential process for solving a problem. Encryption and decryption, well, that's encoding a message and reversing the encryption process to reveal the original message. We've talked a little bit about keys, the common terms for encryption and decryption algorithms, how we put stuff in and how we get stuff out. And then we talked about the Caesar cipher, and we also talked about the random substitution cipher. The idea is that we're going to be encoding based on a fixed length, a fixed amount, or we're going to be encoding based on different letters. So every letter is randomly done to a different letter. So if I go to this, I've got break a Caesar cipher. So I know that if I come in here and I type hello world, what's nice about this is that this will actually do a letter distribution for me. So I'm looking at this. And I notice that the letter L has a very high distribution. And that means that if I was to encrypt this by moving things over three letters, I'm going to see different things over here. And I'm going to try and want to match up my encryption to this encryption. And so this is a tool that we can use to kind of make sure that our table works over here. So I see the A and the B. Maybe if I move those over. But of course, because my message was very short, this table's not going to help. I'm going to put in a longer message here. I've got to paste it pasted in here. Oops, let's just get one of those in. So now I've got my original message in here. Let me drop this back to zero. So if I reset this, notice here is the frequency distribution for my language, and here's what it should be for English. So what I need to do is I need to figure out, okay, I need to figure out where this should be. And I'm looking over here, and I notice that this F is a pretty tall peak. So let's try and move this over a few steps. OK. Now the thing is, that didn't seem to, to get correct, but you may have noticed something as I was in the process of doing this. Right here, I've got this whole message out here. If I take a look, I'm going to see this is a text of the Caesar encryption cipher. Finding the right key is difficult. And I notice that some of my things that have very large, uh, these, these kind of letters seem to match up very well. Not so much over here. So again, the Caesar cipher, if I try and do a letter frequency analysis, it's not going to be perfect, but it's going to be pretty close. I'm going to see some agreement with some of these terms. Now, if I wanted to, I could actually jump down to a random substitution cipher. Let me erase some of this stuff real quick. But what I can do is I can say, okay, I can either sort A through Z by percentages, and if I try and do that, let me try and do that. So this would rearrange our substitutions. So it's rearranging our substitutions here. I can also do it by percentages. So I can see that here's my highest percentages, and if I try and arrange these by percentages, then I can see, oh, maybe O is E, and Z is T, and K is A. So I can see if I can get as much agreement as possible. And notice that's pretty easy to get an agreement in here. So if I had typed in something that used a substitution cipher where every letter was substituted by something different, I could actually use this to kind of take care of this for me as well. So here's a tool at your disposal. 
Um, what I also want you to do is I want you to go through the questions in uh, parts three through seven. Make sure you get these answered in class. And uh, have a wonderful day. Once again, this is Mr. Potter. Thank you for watching.